Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first Coaching Legends and American Heroes webinar uh, with Soldiers of Sidelines for 2022. And I am so proud to kick this year off with the incredible sport of lacrosse. And we have two amazing leaders that we're going to discuss leadership, we're going to discuss wisdom, and some of the unique experiences that led to their success. And our guests uh, for tonight are John Fernandez, who played lacrosse at Army West Point. John Fernandez is a man of firsts. After graduating from West Point and training as an artillery officer, he went to Kuwait with the first wave of troops in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He was among those who moved into Iraq on March 19, 2003, the very first day of the war. Less than a month later, he became one of the first casualties after a rocket slammed his reconnaissance convoy. When John came to, he saw what was left of his legs and realized that his life had changed forever. But even though his body was mangled, he dragged himself back to the vehicle to save another injured soldier. John was sent to Walter Reed Medical Center, where his left foot and right leg below the knee were amputated. He was determined to learn how to use his prosthetics as quickly as possible. And just a few months later, he danced with his wife at their wedding. John was also one of the first injured service members to be helped by the Wounded Warrior Project, which I must say is a dear sponsor partner of Soldiers of Sidelines. So tonight is very, very special in having uh, Coach Fernandez here with us. So John later took a job uh, at uh, WWP and started their alumni program. He set up the first WWP database and intranet system and helped build the organization to what it is today. So really, if it wasn't for John Fernandez, uh, we all wouldn't be here, essentially. So uh, I don't know if you knew that, John, but man, that's a really special place in, in our heart. Think about what you did all those years ago and what it's culminated to now. And you know, even after taking a job outside of WWP, John continues to be involved, helping to raise awareness and funds for other organizations he truly believes in. Uh, John Fernandez currently serves as CEO of Elite Command Solutions. John, welcome. Thanks, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate it, Harrison. It's an honor to be here uh, and just really excited to take part, uh, you know, in this discussion. And um, Thanks. That, that, that's, that's, all, that's all I could say. You know, obviously, uh, being a soldier is important to me. Being an athlete is important to me. A lot of those uh, things co go hand in hand. Uh, you know, there's a synergy there that uh, is kind of unrivaled in, you know, any professional setting, I think, um, with athlete, soldier, military. Um, so I'm just excited to be a part of this. Thanks so much. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. And you know what's so cool about tonight is if you've ever been to a lacrosse convention or a clinic or a seminar, it's like you almost get the most out of it when you're sitting at the table, maybe at the bar with all the other coaches, and you have like this unfettered access to ask questions and, and just discuss life. That's what I always get, a, you know, get from those uh, moments. And to have this conversation with John Fernandez and Coach Petramala is really going to be um, kind of like a once in a lifetime e experience. So our other guest, to no surprise, is Coach Dave Petramala. And if you don't know Coach, he is a legend in lacrosse. Coach Petramala is one of the most famous alumni of Johns Hopkins University, where he both played and coached, not at the same time, but over time. At Hopkins, Petramala was a member of the 1987 National Championship team. He won the Schmeiser Award as the, top, uh, as the nation's top defenseman in 1988 and 1989. And in 1989, he won the Enners Award as the nation's top player. He was also named First Team All-American three times while at Hopkins. Coach Petramala also played for, um, at the club level for the storied Mount Washington Lacrosse Club in the 90s the professional level with the Pittsburgh Bulls in the major indoor lacrosse league and nationally for the United States men's national lacrosse team. He won two world championships in the International Lacrosse Federation World Championship, was named all world in both 1990 and 1994 and best and fairest player MVP in 1990. In addition to these awards, Petromal was named to the NCAA silver anniversary team in 1995 the all-time Johns Hopkins team, and Lacrosse Magazine's all-century team. He was inducted into the National Lacrosse Hall of Fame in 2004. So after 1991, uh, 
Coach took jobs as an assistant coach at the Gilman School in the greater Baltimore area. He was an assistant at Johns Hopkins, University of Pennsylvania, and Loyola College before coming back to Hopkins as its defensive coordinator in 1995. In 1998, he took over the head coaching job at Cornell University, where he was named the National Coach of the Year in 2000. And then in 2001, he took the head coaching position back at Johns Hopkins, where he revitalized the Hopkins program. So in his 20 years at the helm at Hopkins, the Blue Jays had a 207 and 93 record. 18 NCAA tournament appearances, six NCAA Final Four appearances, national championship game appearances in 2003 and 2008, but won the national championship in 2005 and 2007. I mean, it's incredible success. Coach Petromala now enters a new era of leadership at Syracuse University as their defensive coordinator with head coach Gary Gate. The unification of this tandem gives the Syracuse coaching staff arguably the best offensive and defensive players ever in the history of the sport. So it is with all humility uh, and honor to welcome Coach Dave Petromala. Thanks for being here, Coach. Yeah, Harrison, thanks. Thanks to you, Brady, Will, and uh, my good friend Adam Silver and uh, Soldiers to Sidelines. Uh, thrilled to be here with, with John and all of you. Um, you know, it, it, all, all those things you, you said are quite nice and, you know, I almost feel like I should pay you for them, but uh, quite frankly, with John and what he's uh, accomplished, what he's endured, what he's overcome and, and what he sacrificed uh, uh, along with everybody else on, on the Zoom, I'm really not sure I'm quite qualified uh, to be on this with you guys, but I am uh, I'm thrilled to be here excited to uh to talk a little lacrosse a little leadership and uh and thrilled to, to spend some time with john and get to, get to know him and uh and the group a little bit better so thanks for having me certainly coach and i, I really want to start the conversation with john as a matter of fact because uh coach petromile you you just like served it up perfectly um with what you've done john i want to know and i think the whole group here wants to know how has your lacrosse playing experience, like everything that you've done in your life in athletics, set yourself up for your military service when you got in, in, into that one, you know, traumatic moment where you suffered an injury and you go back to save somebody else? In that moment, how much did lacrosse and your training in your life prepare you to really automatically achieve like this hero action? You know, it's 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 hard to express because it, it, it's so much, right? At at West Point, um, there's a quote, and the quote is: "On the fields of friendly strife, are sown the seeds that upon other fields on other days will bear the fruits of victory." Right? And what that simply means is what you learn playing, you know, your respective sport, you carry with you when you know you're when you're in the military and when you're on the sidelines, and you know that. That uh, that phrase is always embedded deep inside every army and you know a cat, you know every army athlete's heart um, because it truly means you know th it truly means something. Um, if I could speak about my own experience, you know when I got to West Point, what probably got me into West Point was lacrosse. Um, not like I was the best lacrosse player in the world, but I guess I was good enough to get in, right? And uh, I had to work really hard. I went to prep school for a year. Um, and then went, you know, went into the academy and I really wasn't getting any playing time, you know, my first two years. And, you know, that, that whole mindset was just work hard, just keep, keep working, keep pushing. You know, at the point I was only, you know, five, eight, 185 pounds. I was a relatively short guy. I wasn't, you know, the most, the fastest guy on the field. I had a pretty good shot and I just wanted to work hard and I just wanted to keep pushing myself. And when you know, my junior year, one of the lacrosse, one of the attackmen I played attack, one of the attackmen that was in front of me, um, uh, you know, uh, in our lineup, um, got hurt. He was a phenomenal player, um, and it was his loss, but it was my gain. And then that year, I went up, for, you know, went from, uh, you know, scoring no goals to becoming the third leading scorer on the team. Um, and then following my junior year, I was honored enough to be voted in as captain. Um, so I went from not playing 
to being one of the leading scorers on the team and being voted in as captain, which I never anticipated. I never thought about it. And I just, just wanted to work hard. I don't even like talking about it just because I don't, it, it was just a matter of having that mindset to work hard. And of course that is carried with me throughout my, my life. You know, um, when I was in the military, you're, you're always experiencing setbacks in the military and in life, right? And it's just the ability to, to, to kind of overcome adversity, to keep pushing, to keep grinding. You know, when I, when I got hurt, when I was hurt and I was sitting on that battlefield and I realized that my life had changed forever, um, my, my first thought was not about how that was going to affect me. It was about the men that, that died next to me. Um, and it was, it was about, okay, let's get this going, you know, and I wanted to know when I could get prosthetics. I wanted to know when I could get walking and I wanted to know. And the hardest thing about it was time. The hardest thing about it was not my effort, what I wanted to put into it. It was time. And that's always hard for people, right? You got to put in the time and sometimes things take time, but during that course, you can't give up, right? You got to keep pushing. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's something that every athlete needs to carry with them. If I didn't, if I had given up and not tried as hard when I was at army, I would have never got the opportunity to play. If I had given up, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be where I am now. I play lacrosse. I do everything that I was able to do before. I like to say um, I'm probably not much slower than I was beforehand. And my change of direction probably isn't much worse. Uh, I have a few more pounds on me, you know, and, you know, the good thing about prosthetics is I could make myself as tall as I want, right? So I could always increase that height weight ratio. So if I'm, you know, eating too many donuts, I just make myself taller. You know, and that's, it, it works for me. So, um, you know, but that relationship between athlete and, um, and veteran and coach cannot be understated because those lessons last a lifetime. Awesome, coach. You know, hearing that story now also, I think Will's taking notes. You're now officially drafted by the Soldiers to Sidelines Shootout for Soldiers team uh, coming up this summer. So now that we know you have great change of direction, you have unbelievable top speed and you're still doing all this, you're gonna be our ringer. So uh, expect to get a call there. And, you know, when I hear that story, I think the central theme is, is hard work. Like it's just, it, it, it's part of your DNA. And before we got on the webinar, Coach Petramala was just talking about a lesson that he was relaying to his team. He's literally coming right from practice to this. So Coach Petramala, when you hear the story that Coach Fernandez is talking about his experience, you were just talking about something you were trying to instill in your players today. What was that and how does that relate to, to Coach Fernandez? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we can instill exactly what John Fernandez has, has in him. Um, you know, clearly he's a unique individual. Um, you know, I, I think about what he's talked about and, you know, how he went from, you know, being a practice guy basically to, to, to being a starter. Um, but I think the more impressive thing to me is that he was a, was a captain and a leader of a team that it's at, at probably the most elite leadership institution in, in, in our world at West Point. Um, that's the thing that impresses it impresses me the most. Um, you know, the, 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 the comment that you're talking about uh, that I share that I've been sharing with our team since uh, the spring started is that we need to be great at the things that take no talent. You know, and when you think about that quote, uh, it, it, hit, it, it hits home. Um, you know, from an athletic uh, athletic standpoint, well, there's a lot of pieces of lacrosse that, that that afford you an opportunity to be successful that take absolutely no talent. It takes no talent to have a positive attitude. It takes no talent to bring energy to what you're doing. It takes no talent to give your very best effort. It takes work, it takes sacrifice, but it doesn't take talent. It takes no talent to be in an appropriate stance off the ball. It takes no talent to pick up a teammate when he's down or to tell it, hold a teammate accountable. And rather than tell him what he wants to hear, tell him what he needs to hear, you know? And so we've talked a lot about 
trying to be great at the things that take no talent. And then the things that take talent uh, is, is working at a, as a team, you know, to, to, to combat and play against teams that are talented. You know, I, I think about John and, and what's happened to him. Um, and I think about a close friend that, that Adam Silva introduced me to, uh, Ben Harrow, who had a similar situation. And, you know, I, both of them, in my opinion, what did they do when things got challenging, when adversity struck? And they both relied on their training. They both went back to what they knew, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I tell our guys here, setbacks open the door for you to rely on your training. You know, they talk, people talk about stepping up. I, I don't think you need to step up. I think, you know, what do they say? Navy SEALs say you step back and you rely on your training. Um, you know, so being successful isn't complicated. It's actually, it's just hard to do. It isn't complicated to understand what it takes to be successful. What's complicated is how hard it is to do those things. You know, and, uh, you know, the other word that we keep using right now around here is discipline. Uh, you know, do what's right, when it's right, all the time. You know, they're all cliches, but, you know, they, they all make complete sense. And when you, when you put them together, it takes no talent to do any of those things that I just talked about. Yeah. Uh... It, it, it's so important to hear that, you know, now listening to your coach, I almost in some ways regret that we didn't get your whole team to hear John's story tonight because it's it just his story and what you were preaching is just so aligned, like, you know, do the things that that don't have any talent, right, that don't require talent, right, do those things well. Um, and, and what's so cool about leadership and also difficult, you, you mentioned the cliches, coach, right? And, you know, we say these things. And I'm going to ask both you guys this question. First, I'm going to uh, position it for John and then back to you, coach. And that is, are there any secrets or uh, strategies that you've used to be able to influence the folks that you lead, whether your players, your employees, whoever, to do those things? Like, how are you getting people to work harder at the things that don't require talent? Um, so John, I'm sure you had to do that when you first took over at WWP, because then now you're you're implementing, creating and implementing new systems. And now you're the CEO of Elite Command Solutions. So how are you influencing others to do the things that don't require talent? You know, uh, there's there's so much involved in, in, you know, I try to read leadership books when I can. I have friends who were in the military that you know, wrote leadership books and, and, and you try and listen to the lessons and you listen to the stories. And, and, and you know, part of it is is doing that, right? It's becoming, um, you know, uh, becoming a master of your craft, so to speak, or like just, just becoming knowledgeable on, 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 those, on those topics, right? So, you know, knowledge is very important, right? Knowledge is very important. Um, you know, the other thing I think is being accountable. And I think that's, that's one of the things that we, you know, we, we struggle with on a daily basis, all, all of us individually, right? How are you making yourself accountable every day to, you know, to your job, to your family, to um, to every aspect of, of your life? And it's hard to do. You know, sometimes it's it's hard to juggle all those things. It's not easy. It's not easy. I, I have seven kids. I'm lucky I could leave the house most days. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, I have my own lacrosse team at home. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, and, and that can be difficult times, right? Especially in times of COVID. Could you, could you imagine that? But in any case, you know, it's the other part of it is, is being accountable um, and, you know, building that trust. You know, one of the things in that's, that's so hard to mimic um, when you talk about this topic, right? Transitioning from a soldier to, um, to an athlete or transitioning from a soldier to a coach, right? It, talking about it, I, I'm at an automatic advantage, right? Because there is no environment in this world that is more representative of teamwork than the military, right? And that's not the fault of athletics in general, any athletic. That's just byproduct of the environment. It's the stakes, right? 
the stakes in any athletic competition are winning and losing. And though some people could view those as life and death, right? In the military, the stakes are actually life and death, right? So comparing those, you're at an automatic disadvantage because the men and women that you serve with, those are the stakes and that's what you're fighting for, right? And many times you're not fighting for a cause or because a commander told you so, or because the president said so, or because of anything. You're fighting for the person to your left and the person to your right. You know, So the question then becomes, okay, with such a bond in the military, how do we translate that? How do we bring that to a team? How do we bring it? How do you bring that bond? You know, and there, there are a lot of different ways to do it. It's, it, it's difficult to do, but making each other accountable, accountable for each, you know, each other. And what coach brought up and the principles that he tried to instill in his practice today, I mean, that's huge. It's being present, right? It's being present all the time. Um, and there's no substitute for that because you're going to have off days when your talent is not here. It's here. Um, or your natural ability maybe is not here. You're relying on that hard work and you're trying to get better, but you always have that baseline, you know, and that could be covered in just working hard and being present and being there. Um, you know, like I shared my story, it's, it's just, Hey, it, if I wasn't there and I, if I gave up, I would have never had that opportunity. It wouldn't have been there. So make the opportunity there. Um, and then relying on, things that you do, you know, and that coaches can help with, right? Core values. What makes you who you are? What makes you a teammate? What makes you part of this team? And what makes it important to be part of this team? Like I said, in the military, it's, it's, it's simple. You're fighting for each other. You know, you're fighting because you're friends with this person. You have a relationship with them. But how do you instill that on, on the athletic field? You know, how do you instill that on, on the lacrosse field? You got to create that bond. They have to be accountable for what they're doing, you know, and most of the time I'm coaching kids. I mean, let's, let's face it with me. It's not, you know, it's not as, it's not as serious, but there is a certain level of accountability. You're there. You need to show up. You need to work your hardest. And that's, you know, something that could take you from childhood through, through the rest of your, your life, you know? Um, so, you know, that's, that's basically what I have to say, you know, on that. Excellent. So, if, if I were to back brief you, what I took away from that, and I think the rest of the group would as well, is getting people to do the things that don't require talent all the time really starts with creating bonds. And we can do that by displaying uh, a foundational knowledge base of what's happening, holding each other accountable and developing trust. And so if we did those three things, we'll have this bond. And then it kind of just like, you know, it happens on its own where people are, are compelled to do the things that don't require talent. Is that a fair recap? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I have one quick story that's, it was, it kind of opened my eyes to this, to this fact. And I, and I, and I, and I, I contemplate, you know, when I'm sitting in bed at night, uh, vibrating from seven children in my house. Right. <laughs> I, uh, I, <laughs> I, I try and think about how, how you could bring that, how you could bring that to whatever, whether it's a business, whether it's an athletic field, whether it's a team that you coach. And one time, you know, I have a friend, Jason Van Camp. He just, he recently uh, wrote a book, Deliberate Discomfort. Um, awesome book, awesome leadership book. And, you know, he was an army football player and he's coached teams. And I, I you know, in, in bringing kind of military experiences to, uh, different sports and I had the honor to go with him one time and we were uh, we were with the Jets we were with the Jets and this was many years ago and so it was at the, the time that Tim Tebow transferred to the team um, so we actually put these guys through military like lanes right where we gave them airsoft guns right and they were experiencing it as if they were in the military walking down lanes encountering enemy and I sat in a bush, right? I sat in a bush with my prosthetic legs off, covered in fake blood. This is how real we were making it, right? And we set off a fake IED, and these guys, now these are NFL guys, big guys, best athletes on, you know, on, on the planet, arguably, uh, you know, with their size and their speed. And, and when that IED went off, and I'm laying in the bush, and I sold it, I sold it, I'm screaming, uh, like as if I had just gotten hurt. 
and they had to come over to me and they had to, you know, firemen's carry me out of there. And, you know, I had a big old lineman pick me up and, and he ran about 50 yards or a hundred yards before he couldn't carry me anymore. And he had to put me down. And you could see at that moment when all of these guys encountered that situation, they didn't know what was going on. It was just like a complete shock. And so to see these guys in these different scenarios that people in the military encounter all the time, it was kind of eye-opening because I realized, you know, I have this unbelievable experience and so many of us that are in, this, in the military have this unbelievable experience of team bonding that no one else gets to see. Um, so I, like I said, I always contemplate, how do we bring that to, uh, to our sidelines? You know, how do we bring that to our boardrooms? How, how, how do we make that translate, you know? Yeah, and, and so that's a great transition back over to Coach Petromalo because, Coach, you've been able to do this at every stop along the way, right? It from, from Cornell to Hopkins and now Syracuse, you're, you're, you, you always are able to do this. And so um, what has worked for you in the past in creating these bonds to, to really get folks to do what doesn't require talent? Well, you know, the, the, the first thing is, you know, uh, as a coach, you, you try to learn and, and where do we learn from? Well, obviously, you know, we learn from the military. Uh, we learn from history, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, those of us that haven't been in the military don't, we don't understand, you know, we don't know what it's like. So, you know, you're, 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 you're dealing with bullets. We're dealing with balls. There's a huge difference there. You know, there's a life and death. There's a life and death situation compared to a win and lose situation so you know number one we got to be careful not to compare the two but we certainly can learn a great deal from what's gone on in history and we can learn a great deal from the military and and how they approach leadership and, and we all know there are so many different schools of, of leadership um you know different branches of the military have different approaches uh each believing that theirs is the right way. And I think number one, that's the key is you have to believe in what you're selling. You've got to believe that your way, it, it matters, it works, you know? And for me, you know, it, it's pretty simple. We're dealing with 17 to 23 year olds. Unfortunately, the worst decision makers, uh, you know, on, on this planet, um, you know, and, and the first thing I try to do is I try to love them. I love them. You know, I tell them I love them. I had a, an opportunity to work with uh, Adam Silva. He's had a chance to kind of see this firsthand and, and be a part of it. And, you know, I, I'm invested in them. They, you know, there's the old saying, you know, they're not going to care until they know how much you care. Well, you know, I love them. I invest in them. Um, you know, I'm not easy on them. I don't tell them what they want to hear. I tell them what they need to hear. You know, and I think deep down, young people want that. You know, th they want a level of discipline and, and they can handle it as long as they know that it's coming from someone who's invested in them, someone who cares about them, someone who, uh, you know, wants, wants them to be the best version of, of themselves. You know, so, so that's one, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting. When I first started coaching, I wanted to be a motivator. I thought that was the way to lead. And, uh, you know, I happened to, to have the opportunity to work with some guys, some Navy SEALs, some Rangers, you know, and again, there's a little bit different philosophically there in terms of leadership and what's the right way, um, you know, and then I wanted to be inspiration. I wanted to inspire, you know, my players. And, and what I've quickly come to realize is you got to be yourself, you know, and, and you know, my, 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 my ex-wife used to tell me, uh, why don't you let them see what I see at home? And that, that, that really kind of, it stuck with me. And I think about, I, I would often think about how I am with them in the office, how I am with them off the field, and yet how I was on, on the field, you know, and I was a, a motivator, you know, so then I wanted to be inspirational. And then, uh, quite frankly, I, I can't be Mr. Positivity. That's just, it's, it's just not me. You know, I, I need to be who I am. And when I think someone's not doing a good job, I, I'm going to tell them, you know, and 
I'm not sure I always pick the right, the right words, but the intent is, is there. Um, so what I've come to realize is you need to have a combination of both inspiration and motivation. Inspiration is positive leadership. Motivation can be both positive and negative. And I do believe there is a place for a little negativity. There is a place to tell a guy, hey, pardon my language, but you need to cut the shit. You need to get yourself together here. And you need to be accountable for exactly what you're being asked to do in a standard you're asked to, you're being asked to meet. So you invest in them, you love them, you care about them, you, you know, and you let them know that and you be vulnerable. You let them know who you are. The next piece is you got to get them to do that with one another. You know, and, and the easiest way to do that is to put them under duress. You put them in challenging moments where they have to start to rely on one another. They find out who they can count on, who they can't. You make things difficult and you force them, rather than fracturing, you force them to come together as a team, as a defensive unit, as an offensive unit, as a man down unit. You start to, to force them to come together and help them understand the only way they're going to be successful is by working collectively, not independently of one another. You know, the other thing is, I don't think you can treat every kid the same. Now, that doesn't mean the standard is different for any kid. It doesn't mean your expectation that they give 100%, not 110, not 120. We can only give 100%. But you, would, you hold them all to the same standard, all to the same expectation. But how you communicate with one guy, I, I've come to learn, at least with teenagers, has to be different than how you communicate with another. One guy may respond to a kick in the tail. The other guy, I've, I've come to find out that, you know, you might have to put your arm around him, stroke him a little bit. But at the end of the day, as long as you're holding them all to the same standard, the same set of core values, the same, you know, level of excellence, then the fact that you're communicating with them differently, I, I, I don't think is an issue. But, you know, once they know you love them, once they know you care, once they know, you know, I'll, I'll use their words. Their words is they want to know that you have their back. You hear it all the time from teenagers now. He doesn't have my back. Or coach, you didn't have my back. When they know you have their back, quite frankly, I, I, I think there's a level of loyalty in these kids that people don't realize. And, and they actually want to have your back. Uh, I, I, I think we've painted a picture of kids today that isn't such a great one. I, I can tell you this. I'm with a new group of young men. Uh, I walked in here, you know, and I'm coming from enemy territory. You know that. Um, you know, I've been, co I've been coaching against these guys for 20 years everywhere I've been. And no offense, there's, there's been no love lost. And I, I've never hid that. But when I walked in the door, they opened their arms. They welcomed me. They were respectful, you know, and, and, and it was critical that I do the exact same. And the fact of the matter is you win with people and you win with relationships. And if you have lousy relationships, no offense, you ain't winning. If you don't have good people, you ain't winning. You know, and, and, and I think those are, are, are the critical components. Yeah, there's a lot of other stuff. But when you boil it down to its simplest form, if you love someone, you'll do anything for them. You'll be, you'll be honest with them and tell them what they need to hear. And you'll be accountable for them. Fantastic coach. You know, it, it essentially for all of our soldier coaches that have been through our certification seminars, you pretty much just summed up everything that we go through in a week. You know, you talk about inspiration and motivation and how those are intertwined, but that really happens through love and through care and through candor, right? That's a huge thing. You're talking about what they need to hear, being candid. Um, you talk about communication and how that's different for each of the individuals. And then ultimately, you got to be your authentic self. And when you do all those things, the inspiration, the motivation just oozes out of you. And you're not like really trying to do it. It just it just happens 
because you're doing all those other things. So, yeah, Harrison, and, I'll be honest with you. The, the, the gentlemen on, on, on this Zoom are probably more qualified and better trained than I am at this. Having done what they've done and been where they've been, they're probably, when you, when you want to boil it down to its simplest form, they've been trained better than I do. I'm learning from people like all of you. That's, that, that's where I'm getting my information from my knowledge. So every guy in the Zoom call ha ha has the background to be able to do these things. Now, being able to do something and being able to communicate it and actually do it are two, are, 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 are two different things. You, you know, so you may not feel comfortable. You know, we all know you got to get out of your comfort zone and learn to be com comfortable in uncomfortable moments. But everybody on, on this Zoom call ha has the qualifications, or I should say the training, to be able to do the things that we're talking about. Certainly. And what I'll do now is if, if anybody has questions for Coach Fernandez and Coach Petramala, just put a question mark in the chat, and then I'll ask you to unmute yourself uh, so you can ask your question, uh, and then we can go that way. And while people are thinking about their questions, I just want to pose this real quick to keep the conversation going is uh, coach Petramal, I know you have um, a strong relationship with coach Bill Belichick, you know, and I would love to know, this is like a personal, one of my questions for you is, man, what would it be like to listen in on one of your conversations? Like, what are you guys talking about? And what are you telling him about culture and leadership? Um, Cause man, I think, Everyone on this call would pay a million dollars to hear one minute of that conversation. Yeah, well, I would, you know, if, if I'm speaking honestly, I would tell you I'm listening more than I'm talking. Um, you know, you got a, a multi, multi-time Super Bowl champion, probably the greatest coach uh, in football, in, in, in pro football. You know, I, 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 I'm listening. I'm not saying a whole lot. Um, I'll tell you a, a quick story about coach. Um, number one, he's everything you don't think he is and everything you, th you, th you think he might be. He's got a great sense of humor. He's got a tremendous sense of humility. Um, you know, he, he, he's just a terrific guy and a, and a great friend. So I was introduced to him uh, via a phone call. His daughter, Amanda, who is a coach, um, her co high school roommate, uh, went to Hopkins and was one of our student trainers. And she always said, you know, coach, you would love coach Belichick. You guys would get along great. So, uh, you know, there was, and she shared the same with him. And uh, we, we won the national championship in 2005, went undefeated with a senior class that never lost a game on Homewood field for four years. Pretty, pretty neat group to be with. And we go into 2006 and, you know, you want to talk about leadership. I feel like I'm failing as a leader because we're, we're, we're just awful. We're awful in the fall. We're comfortable with where we are. You know, it's almost like after 17 years of not winning and then we won, our needs were met and, and, and we had accomplished what we wanted to. And now the team in 2006 was living off of what the team in 2005 did, you know, and we weren't hungry. We were complacent. Complacency is the enemy of greatness. We all know that. So I, I, get a, I come off the uh, field and our admin says to me, you know, we had a little bit of a problem. So I'm thinking, oh my God, what happened? She goes, well, I got a phone call. A gentleman asked for you and I said you were out on the field and asked if I could take a message. And he said, yeah, would you please tell him that Bill Belichick called? And she proceeded to tell him to cut the shit and hung up on him. <laughs> so I said, what? And I'm not, not fully comprehending what, what she just said. And she says, well, he called back. And, you know, again, I, I asked for you, said you were out on the field. He said, please, could you tell him that Bill Belichick called? And she said, would you just cut the shit and hung up? That's twice now. Why he ever called back a third time is beyond me. I think it says a lot for him. And finally convinced her that he was actually Bill Belichick. And as she tells me, she's like, coach, I'm so sorry. But all week long, one of our former players, Pete Lasor, who is just a great kid and a great personality, was calling. And he was telling her, 
that is Coach Petromala there? No, well, please tell him James Gandolfini called or Bobby Knight called, or he had called all week saying he was someone else, and she thought it was Peter Lasore. So now I'm in a panic. I go in my office. I pick up the phone. I call him. I'm the first thing I'm a like, coach. It is great to meet you. Before we go any further, I, I really have to apologize for what happened. He's like, don't even worry about it. And Harrison, uh, we wound up talking for about an hour and a half on the phone. First conversation ever. And all I wanted to do was ask him questions about the Patriots, about his team, about leading them and, you know, how they operate in their culture. And all he wanted to do was talk about lacrosse. So I've developed a great relationship. And I think the greatest lesson that I've learned from coach is listening. He will listen to, and he brings in, you know, national championship squash coaches to talk to him and to his team. He's the kind of guy who thinks he can learn something from a rocket scientist or someone who's homeless on the street. He is, he, he has taught me how critical listening to those around you is and that you can learn you, you can and should be willing to learn something from everybody what an incredible story uh yeah a little embarrassing so have, to be quite honest with you yeah but but it's great now in hindsight like it, it adds humor like all this stuff and sometimes those instances are, are really a great foundation for a long enduring friendship and uh professional relationship so good recovery there i'll, I'll say that much um <laughs> <laughs> so coach well, Dow, he, I, i'm not sure if he wasn't such a good guy it would have been a very good recovery it would have yeah. been uh maybe one of the bigger failures in, in, in my life well we're on the positive side of that Coach Dow, do you have a question? Uh, Dan, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, appreciate you, gents, for spending the time with us this evening. This is uh, it's pretty impactful. I'm scribbling notes as fast as I can. Um, Coach Petromala, with all your experience coaching and playing lacrosse over the decades, you've seen LaxCon and all the co conventions. Do you have a personal database or archive of your favorite drills that you think are the most impactful way of teaching, whether it's approach angles or strike zone or whatever it is, when you see something is a need for your team, do you know, you have some method of organization that you, you fall back on? Yeah, you know, obviously, you know, you think about military, one of the first things you think about is leadership. One of the next things you think about is organization. And I do, I have a, I have a drill library. So what I do is I got a, a, a notebook, I got it sitting right next to me, to be quite honest with you. I uh, used it today, went back and looked at some drills. Um, but a drill, the drill library I have is on, is on my computer. If I find something that, uh, you know, that I, I find interesting or I think is beneficial or there's a piece of it we can use, I'll clip it. I'll put it in my drill library. Uh, I've got drills from when I first got back to Hopkins till drills that we're doing now. Uh, if I have to, had to give you a favorite, you know, usually my favorite is whatever, you know, whatever our greatest need is uh, at that time. Um, you know, I think drills are ever evolving. And, you know, I, I mentioned listening. I, I went down to our coaches convention uh, in, uh, in um, Florida at the IMLCA not long ago. It, it, and I learned something from uh, Charlie Toomey, you know, ver it was verbiage. Okay, we, we, we usually talk heel to toe about approaches. They, they, they use the word shade shoulders. I liked it. I loved it. So I stole it. You know, they say, uh, you know, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Uh, but I think my favorite drill, Daniel, is, is four and fours. I think it encompasses everything defensively that we do. Uh, it's, it's got a one-on-one -on -one component of it. It's got an off-ball component of it. It's got a team component of it, a slide rotate component to it, a recovery component to it. And when you, when you think about it and you're playing defense and you slide, you got four other guys that are moving. So I, it, it breaks down the part of the whole, you know, and for me, from a defensive standpoint, that would be the drill. If I ever, if I had to say there's one I fall back on and like the most, that would be it. Awesome. Great answer. I, I'm, I'm an attack man. We just like shooting drills. That's, that's... <laughs> well, 
Well, well, Coach Fernandez, you know, while other folks, yeah, guys, feel free to put your question in the chat, or just even if you put a question mark in the chat and you don't want to write the whole thing, that's fine. Um, I'll, I'll give you the mic. But Coach Fernandez, while other folks are asking their questions, when you hear Coach Petromala talk about uh, confidants, right? Like people that he calls like Bill Belichick to um, talk leadership, different perspective for you in your role as CEO and, and all the different leadership roles you've held. Do you have somebody? And if so, who is it that you feel like I'm going to pick up the phone and call this person to discuss? Yeah. You know, there, there's so many people, um, you know, even, even my, my wife, when I come home, you know, um, it's, you know, you, you need to rely on other people. You can't, uh, you, you can't do it alone. You know, we're, we're not in this, in this alone, you know, in the military, you liken, you know, a lot of things to being in a tribe and, and, uh, and, you know, forming a group. Well, you know, that also translates to having those people that you could trust, you know, and having those people that you could reach back to, you know, in my life, there's been, there are coaches, um, which, which have been awesome. There are, you know, military leaders that, that have been awesome. And I'm lucky enough to have friends um, that, like I said, you know, friends that have written books on this, friends that I can learn from. And, and it blows my mind, you know, that, that I have these guys as, as resources, as, as they, you know, knock down their, their challenges and they knock down all the roadblocks that, that are in their way. And to be able, um, you know, being in the military, I'm lucky to have, uh, you know, a group of people that, 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 that live that life, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, but it's also important to have that, you know, for everyone to have that, because you need to be able to talk these things out. You can't do it alone, you know, and I can look at it so many ways. If you look at, uh, you know, men and women, when they come, you know, men and women who have served when they come back home, uh, you know, a lot of times we're carrying the burdens of war with us, you know, um, and unfortunately for, you know, men or women, uh, I would say competitive people, right? It's kind of in many times against our nature to reach out for help um, and to reach out. It just kind of, uh, it's unnatural, it seems like. And you kind of have to break past that barrier because it's such an important aspect of growth, right? Growth and becoming a better, becoming the best coach, the best uh, you know, leader that, that you could be, um, you know, men and women, you know, soldiers, uh, you know, military service members, when they come back home, need to be able to reach out, uh, to people who have made that transition and who have done it before. Um, you know, obviously in the veterans community, you know, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, how, how do we address these issues that these men and women have that we come back and, you know, which the ultimate um, horrible situation is, is suicide. You know, unfortunately, that's that's an issue because they share, share some, you know, they, they experience so much of a burden is, and that's reaching out. You know, when I first joined WWP and started going to their events, right? For me, it wasn't even about, uh, I dealt with my injuries relatively well, but when I came back home, right? It's not like it was in World War II. Um, Many years ago, there was a documentary on PBS and it was called The War. I, I think it was called The War. Um, and during the World War II era, right, when men and women came home, you know, the guy to the left of you stormed the beaches of the Normandy. The, the guy, to, you know, the guy to the right of you, um, you know, uh, jumped into Italy. Uh, they, everyone, everyone in this country had served. And if you didn't serve, you were supporting the war effort, right? So when you came back home after war, you had those bonds automatically, right? Now, when you come home, less than 1% of our population is served. We could pretty much have a war without ever affecting anyone's lifestyle, without them having to make any sacrifice. So we, when we come back into our communities, there's not much there. So it takes effort to reach out. And it's not like an organization like Wounded Warrior Project or other veterans organizations get a list of people who just left the military who we need to reach out, you know, the onus becomes on the individual, on the soldier to reach out and find those common bonds. And like I said, when I went to WWP, I would go uh, to these events with other wounded warriors, right? Other people who were hurt. And I likened it to a car show, 
right? I was going to a car show and I'd lift up the pant leg and be like, hey, what do you got under the hood, right? <laughs> what, what, what hardware are you sporting, you know? And sometimes you wear that on your shoulder. Sometimes it's under your pant leg. And many times it's what's in here, right? And it's just those shared experiences. And obviously that translates to coaching and, and uh you know, in, in those environments, sometimes we don't want to reach out to help, but it's such an important component. Um, and that means reaching out to those that have mentored us, those in the past that, that we've, uh, have really left an indelible mark on our souls, you know, uh, to, to, to be the best that we can be. Um, and, and, and it, and, and it just can't go understated. It's, it's a huge aspect of being the best coach you can be. Yeah. And, John, you know, that's, that's the best part about Soldiers of Sidelines is, is this tribe. We, we all have each other. We coach together. We have these forums that we get to connect and, and really learn from each other. But then we get to connect with our communities to really make a difference on the young athletes there. And, and who knows, you know, maybe we'll have so much influence as uh, military coaches that more folks decide to serve and we can make that 1%, maybe 2%. You know, that would be a, a huge uh, boon. So we have literally seven minutes left and we have a couple questions. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Christopher Lowe. Coach Lowe, you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, sorry, it took me a favor. Um, yeah, Coach, I had a question. Um, you've uh, been between several programs like Gilman and Hopkins and uh, now Syracuse. Were you ever um, nervous when you went to the, when you, transition to these other schools uh, like in my case I just came up from the MCLA to uh, the NCAA to coach at Maine Maritime Academy I was a little nervous when I first got up here yeah you know you, you know there's two reasons to be nervous one you're nervous because you're not prepared or two you're nervous because you care and, and, and you want it to you want it to be great I have to tell you as I mentioned earlier, I'm coming from enemy territory, you know, coming in here. I wasn't nervous. I was scared shitless. I, I wasn't sure how they were going to accept me. You know, I, I, what are they going to think? You know, who have they talked to? All they know is, you know, unless I recruited them and got to know them real well, all they know is the guy on the other sideline for, you know, for the last couple of years. So I, I, I was nervous, you know, but like anything else, you know, you, 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 you deal with it head on, you deal with your discomfort, you know, and for me, as I said, I'm blessed. These young men have been great. I, I, I really enjoyed them. And in, and in a short period, I've come to love them and care about them. Uh, but absolutely, I'm, I'm nervous before every game. I was never nervous as a player because I controlled what was going to go on. I'm nervous as a leader because I'm, I, I, I got to make sure that the training that I've provided them, you know, has covered every scenario. And if a scenario comes up and they're not prepared for it, not their fault, it's my fault. So yeah, absolutely, I get nervous. But you know what, I think something that's important is, uh, you know, you keep that to yourself. I think people thrive off of your confidence. Um, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I think we live in a world where there's a lot of false confidence and, and people, if you, if you say the right thing, they, they think they're confident. And at the end of the day, confidence comes from one, one or two things, either preparedness or demonstrated ability. So, uh, but to answer your question, yeah, uh, I was nervous coming up here. I wasn't nervous going from Gilman to Hopkins, probably, to be honest with you. I was too young and too stupid and too naive to worry about it. Great answer. Good question. So, Coach Joe Nearney, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Uh, uh, Coach Petromala, first things first, just want to say kind of weird being a longtime fan seeing you in orange. Um, but you've mentioned that a couple of times already. Uh, also, side note, I just want to say that uh, being a young punk, it was really cool uh, looking up on YouTube and watching you beat up on uh, my old youth coach, uh, Neil Redfern in the final four back in the day. Um, but 1989. Uh, yep. Um, great mullets back then. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, my question is about like the, the I don't, I don't want to say the problem kid, but 
for lack of a better term, the problem kid, right? The, you, you love them, you do everything that you can. At what point in time, I don't want to say you cut ties, but what's, what's something you can do when you, you, he's a good kid, you know he's a good kid, but he just keeps making the wrong mistakes off the field at the wrong times to try and unscrew the situation or to better yet, or, or worse, obviously worst case scenario would be to cut the ties, but something about, you know, he's got uh, something wrong with the home life. There's something there, but you got to do, there's only so much you can do as a coach versus, you know, a parent, what have you. Yeah, you know, Joe, I, I, I'm sorry to say if I could give you the exact answer to this, I would, I would be a billionaire because I would write a book and every parent of a teenager would be calling me and buy, or buying that book. Um, you know, look, at the end of the day, you got, you, you, you got to love them. Um, you got to hold them accountable. Um, you know, at, it, it, at our level, at the level that I'm at, you know, we do hold something over their head that matters to a lot of them. That's playing time. You know, and when you all of a sudden decide to yank some playing time, sometimes, you know, a knucklehead like me will wake up and, and figure it out. Um, if the, uh, you know, if, if, if the issues are deeper seated than that, which sometimes they are, you know, there's a divorced home or there's a death in the family or maybe even something even worse, alcoholism or whatever. Um, look, you hang in there, you fight for them, you, 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 you have their back. But at some point in time, the greater good has to take, take over. That doesn't mean you have to cut ties with the kid. You may cut ties with the kid on your team. And you may have to ask him to step away. But that doesn't mean you have to cut ties with the kid. So I had a boy I coached that had similar issues that we had to ask to step away. Just wasn't, uh, it was cancerous and it was hurting our team. My job as the leader is to take care of the, 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 the greater good. And one, one person's needs don't outweigh the other 49 or 50. So we removed them from the team, but I remained in contact with them. Um, actually went to counseling with him and, you know, tried to remain supportive a, a, as much as he would allow me and as much as you know, was appropriate. So I, I, don't, I don't think you, you have to cut ties with the kid, but you may have to remove the problem from the situation in order to not negatively impact the greater good. I hope that answers your question, Joe. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Awesome, guys. And, you know, I, I love all the questions coming in now, but we're at, we're at the top of the hour here and, you know, we could spend all night doing this, but that's what we're part of. Like Soldiers of Sidelines Tribe, and we're going to have many, many more of these in the future. So check your emails and get involved. And also, I'm going to challenge everybody, spread the word. Let's get more of us out there in the communities doing good, coaching, becoming character-based coaches so we can bring this to the youth that needs you. They need you. The country needs you. You are continuing to serve your country now as a coach. So spread the word. Our next lacrosse coaching certification seminar is coming up on Monday. It starts. We got a great lineup and it's not too late to get people involved. So grab somebody. Tell them if they want to get involved, want to learn a little bit, have them come to this thing. And then also for all of our soldier coaches in this call, you know, we do tons of events now. COVID's relaxing. We're doing, we got tickets to the Georgia Tech uh, Clemson basketball game. Coach Passner is a huge supporter of, of Soldiers of Sidelines. Just because you're a lacrosse coach doesn't mean you can't get involved in the basketball stuff and the football stuff and the sports. Get involved, man. You're, you're, you're part of the tribe. We're doing this together. And uh, I just appreciate you all so much. Coach Fernandez, thank you so much for your time and sharing your story tonight. Um, you want to give us one last parting message before we uh, end on Coach Petromala's walkout song? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you, guys. You know, uh, having the opportunity to speak, uh, you know, I really honestly think that my my experience is probably parallel, you know, most other veterans coming out of service um, with with our shared experiences. And I don't, 
I don't hold myself, you know, to any, anything other than that. And I like to think most of my friends who served would have dealt with, you know, the experiences that I've been through in, in the same way. Um, and coach Petromala, thanks for, you know, sharing the stage for me tonight. An absolute honor, you know, grew up as a kid, uh, you know, just idolizing you as a, as a player and, um, you know, it's just awesome to, to be a part of it. Never did I ever think I would be, uh, you know, again, sharing that stage with you. So, you know, it's just awesome. And, and I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Hey, John, you, you got to be kidding me. Thanks for the privilege of being here with you. Like I, like, like I said, I, I, I'm well aware. Uh, accomplishments on the field are great. They're, they're, they're nice. They're, they're fun. Um, but the accomplishments and the sacrifices that you all have made are, are far different and far greater than uh, the things that I've done. So thanks, Saracen, to you and, uh, and to, to the whole group, and especially to John, for, uh, for all you've done and, and continue to do. And thanks for letting me be a part of this. I'm also of glad, course, guys. I'm also glad that we coordinated on our facial hair today. I mean, that was that was spot on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all we all coordinated our hair except for Harrison. <laughs> yeah. Biological, damn it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, guys, you know I appreciate it. I call you all coach because we are all coaches every day in every aspect of our life, and I just appreciate everyone spending the time to improve our coaching craft. Like you know. As much as we have the uh, coaching legends and American heroes and all of us, we, you know, we're, we're all just trying to get better. And we all just got a little bit better sharing these stories tonight. So thank you all so much. And uh, come join us the next time. Everyone have an awesome, awesome night.